Welcome to Kitchen Talk, everyone. I am your host, Lee Ann Moore. I am so excited today. It is October the 22nd. We have the Honorable Mayor of this beautiful city of Pasadena, Mayor Terry Tornick. He is up for re-election for mayor. We want to re-elect him for the mayor of Pasadena. He's done a wonderful job. And um, I have him on the show today. We're going to have a great discussion. This is a live interactive show. So all of you out there watching on YouTube and Facebook, please put your comments in your comment section below. Like, share, and subscribe if you're on YouTube. This will also go replay after the show, but today we have Mayor Tornick live on the show. We're gonna bring him up and uh, we're gonna have a great discussion with him. And uh, we'll see if we can get him on the show. How are you, Mayor? I'm on the love train. That was a great <laughs> That's <opening>. right. That's <laughs> right. That is right. That is right. Um, so let me get this off here. Okay. So thank you, Mayor Tornick, for coming on the show. You have a very, very busy schedule. <laughs> and I'm honored. Uh, I'm not prime time yet, but I'm honored to have the mayor of Pasadena. I tell you, I uh I am a resident of Altadena. I was born and raised in California, you know, here in Los Angeles County. I've attended all the, you know, Pasadena Unified School Districts. Well, you know, the few. And um, I love Pasadena. It's a beautiful city. And uh, you're running for mayor. How how are you doing in your campaign, and how are you feeling right now? Well, I feel great. Um, it, it is it's a tense time, honestly. Yes. Um, this is a hard fought campaign. And you know, the, the truth is that um, the way I campaign, the way I typically campaign when I ran for city council and when I ran last time for mayor, the basis of my campaign is going door to door and meeting people at their, at their front door, talking with them on the porches. And I was looking forward to uh, doing that uh, between March and November, but as you know, uh, the pandemic had another idea and so it, it won't let me go door to door. So we've had to find other ways to reach out to voters. And that's why I'm here this morning, uh, because we still have to communicate with voters and, and let them know what our message is and what we're about and hear from them uh, what they care about and what their concerns are. And so we've been, I think, creative and we've had a lot of help from sort of an army of volunteers in doing that. Uh, but it has been a little bit frustrating. It's just one of those other adjustments we've all had to, had to make because of the pandemic. Yes, uh, it has. And, uh, 
you know, we talk about COVID in the, on the show, and I want to give the sympathy to all the uh, Pasadenians, friends and families who's, who've lost someone due to COVID. I understand as of last week, there were about 129, and you can correct me, that passed uh, due to COVID. Um, but we're talk, we'll talk about that, um, you know, in the show. But I'm so happy you're here. Um, now, campaigns can be really nasty. There's a lot of smears out there. I want you to clear them up on Kitchen Talk uh, this morning. And again, this is an interactive show. You're live with uh, the beautiful city of Pasadena, Mayor Tornick, and I am Liam Moore. I'm the host of Kitchen Talk. And if you have any questions, please put them on the uh, comments below. And uh, you know, if we get enough time, you know, we will try to address everyone. Uh, but Mayor, uh, let's talk a little bit. I have um, something here. It says there have there have been two important milestones within the, the past two years that received unanimous support from the council. Uh, both had come before the council previously and each time it failed. One was having an African sister city, which took uh, almost 20 years, I believe, of requesting and the other was the police oversight that you and council member Kennedy presented in 2016. And the council did not approve that. Finally, under your leadership, both passed unanimously and uh, support from, you know, from the council. Uh, what was the difference? Well, I think uh, in the case of the sister city, um, the way the sister city program works and, and Pasadena has had a sister city relationship that goes back 70 years. Wow. It's really amazing. Yeah. Uh, we have a sister city relationship with uh, Germany, a city in mm -hmm. Germany, Ludwigshaven. It's well established, but the beauty of the sister city program is that it's not a big city hall funded effort. It's really a grassroots effort. It's something that has to come from the community. There have to be people in the community that want to make it happen, that want to establish this relationship. So that in the case 70 years ago, the reason that Pasadena was one of the first to have a sister city with anybody in the world uh, was because there were Quakers in Pasadena that saw film of uh, children in Germany right after World War II picking through garbage cans looking mm -hmm. for something to eat. Interesting. And they said, we can't have this. I mean, we can't permit this to happen. We need to send mm -hmm. what were then called care packages mm -hmm. uh, to Germany and save these children. And that created this sister city relationship with Ludwigshaven, which was a city that was bombed into rubble in World War II. Uh, so fast forward, you know, 70 years, and we have a situation where uh, people in Pasadena, primarily in the African-American community that said, you know, we've got sister cities in Asia and in Europe and, you know, why don't we have one that we can identify with uh, in Africa? Uh, Africa is a critical continent. It's an emerging continent. It means so much in terms of the educational efforts. We can we can provide role models and, and cultural affinity for our children. Um, we need to have a, a, a sister city in Africa. And that <laughs> that conversation went on and for a variety of reasons, um, it just never was successful. And they came really close a couple of times with, with a number of cities in South Africa, um, but it just didn't happen. And so finally, they hit on um, Dakar Plateau in, in the country of Senegal, and they got uh, Dakar, after a lot of research and, and a lot of effort, this, this determined uh, committee uh, found a way to forge this relationship with Dakar Plateau, an emerging city, an important place in Africa, in the history of Africa and currently in Africa. And I had some questions about it, honestly. I wasn't, uh, it's, it's a Muslim country. Uh, there were some issues there having to do with homophobia that I was concerned about. Okay. Um, and I posed those questions to the committee and they satisfied me that they had answers for those questions. And they, they on their own, at their own expense, they did an expeditionary trip to Dakar to explore uh, the possibility of that relationship. And once I saw how committed they were 
and how uh, how uh, receptive uh, the government in Dakar Plateau was and the mayor there, I said, okay, I'm, I'm all in. And so we made this relationship. There was a, uh, a big delegation that came from Dakar Plateau to visit Pasadena. The committee staged an event that was, uh, by anybody's standards, really extraordinary. And I, those poor people from Dakar, they were so exhausted. <laughs> I can imagine. I can't imagine how they were they standing. They excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, they, but they were great and, and they were uh, culturally interesting and sophisticated. Uh, their their uh, attire, you know, their dress um, was extraordinary. Yeah, the yeah. people were attractive. They were cultural, culturally advanced and, and uh, friendly and wonderful. And so we signed the agreement with uh, Dakar Plateau and, and uh, that's the beginning of what I hope will be an important relationship that will really be culturally important uh, for, for people in Pasadena, for children in Pasadena to be able to understand uh, what modern Africa is about. Okay, that's 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 true. That's a great point. Uh, I, uh, like I said, I went to a public school here, uh, Longfellow. I had a teacher, she's retired. I'll give her a shout out, Miss Pamela Powell. Um, oh, I, I know learned, Pamela. yes, I My learned. My son had her at Longfellow. <laughs> yes, and uh, I've had her for second and fifth grade, if I can recall. And I, to this day, I've learned how to use, chop, use chopsticks because she brought in different foods uh, from the community um, and taught us how to use chops, chopsticks. So she introduced us to a lot of things back in those days about other countries and things like that. So I can understand the young people. They had firsthand uh, with the people from Dakar. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to play a video. Um, it's a recent uh, sit down with... Um, Pasadena school uh, teacher, Carla Boykin. Okay, and I'll come back to you. This trip meant a lot to me because as an educator, I wanted to share this experience with my kids, my students. So we started a um, pen pal exchange. I had them write letters in English that they uh, translated into French and that we were gonna share with the uh, students over there in Africa. We were uh, more aware on our trip that things were changing. Things were shifting quite rapidly and um, the mayor, Mayor Turnick, was always in touch with what it passed to think was going on in Pasadena. Well, I think he's been handling it quite well. Like I said, uh, being informed, I think, is key. Um, I know when I got back, I was glued to the television, and I wanted to get know as much about what was going as possible, um, how I could stay he healthy. Uh, and I was glad to see that Pasadena was locked down. I thought we did a great job um, of making sure that people were safe and keeping the restaurants closed and keeping the, the barbershops and the, the hair stations and the, the nail salons and all those things that I love to go to, but I, I knew that it wasn't the right time. Your best bet is to stick with the leadership we currently have. So I think passing the community is doing well and I think it takes leadership. Leadership is uh, guiding us. Um, being cautious as to uh, when things should open and um, having to deal with some problems, some rough decisions and people who are not, everybody's not going to be happy with the decisions are made. Um, but you need someone who is decisive and I think Mayor Turner is very decisive, you know, doing what's best for people. Um, I know I feel that way. I feel that, you know, the decisions we've made are, is best for me and my family and, and the community. All right, Mayor, we're back. Do we have you back? Yeah. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. That was a great um, uh, conversation that uh, uh, Teacher Boykin uh, provided, um, and it was an experience for her students. So we're going to take a couple of questions. Um, I have one from uh, Sean um, Brumfield. It says, Mayor, uh, what is your stance on 
well, I'm sorry, what is your stance or opinion on charter schools and why? I think charter schools um, are all over the place. Uh, I think uh, Pasadena doesn't have as many charter schools as Los Angeles does or some other communities do. Uh, but I think they, they can provide a very valuable ro role. Um, I think, for example, Learning Works um, and uh, what Michael Aran is, is doing uh, with Learning Works um, works really in, in close contact with uh, the public school system, and they are able to uh, provide learning opportunities for a group of, of, of students who have not been successful uh, in public school. And so I think that, that in that instance, ch uh, a charter school really is an important adjunct um, as part of the public school um, opportunities. There are some other charter schools that I, I, I think are a mixed bag in terms of how they perform whether they're in competition with or supplementary to the, um, uh, the public school system. The wrap on charter schools, obviously, is that to the extent that they divert children from the public school system, um, they reduce the amount of funding that's available to the public schools, and that's not necessarily desirable. I think that the whole charter school um, experiment uh, is one that uh, sort of the final results are not in yet. Uh, in Pasadena or statewide. So I have a, sort of a variety of opinions about charter schools in Pasadena. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, well, let's see if we have another um, comment here. We have another comment uh, from an Anthony. It says, culture diversity is good. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and uh, you know, the purpose of the the criticism we, we got about the, um, uh, the trip to Senegal was that it was at the beginning of the outbreak that we went uh, and ignored the emerging crisis um, and that I uh, failed in my responsibilities as mayor because I wasn't on scene. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Mr. McFarland's, Mr. McFarland's point about uh, cultural diversity is at the heart of why we had this relationship with uh, Dakar. Um, this is not some sort of trivial exercise. As I, as I tried to say before, this was a grassroots effort that took decades to achieve. It was not a trivial junket. Everybody paid their own way. Uh, it was not at city expense. It's because people are committed to the idea of establishing educational uh, programs for children in Pasadena to be able to relate to a sister city in Africa as well as to Europe and Asia. Uh, so it was really important. And I think at the time that we made the trip, of course, we had no idea that at that point there wasn't a single case of COVID in, in Pasadena and certainly no deaths. Um, so it's easy sort of looking backward to second guess and say, well, that was a dangerous time. You probably shouldn't have gone. And in fact, we had to cut our trip short and scurry back before the, all the airports shut down. Uh, so that was no fun. But um, at no time was I disconnected from the my responsibilities as mayor. Uh, and I continued to remotely uh, connect with the city manager and others to make sure that I was aware of what was happening in Pasadena and, and providing my level of input in terms of what should be happening in terms of preparation mm -hmm. for, the, for the pandemic. And that's what I've been devoted to for the past seven months is trying to bring Pasadena safely through this, uh, this terrible time. Right. And um, I appreciate that, Mayor. Um, that was going to be one of my next questions. Uh, you got a lot of pushback and, uh, um, you know, you left the country right at the pandemic and, you know, you left everybody just, you know, what are we going to do? Um, I also know I've done a little research on you <laughs> that I believe you only missed one meeting as a uh, mayor, right? Am I close or am I right? No, that's right. In five years, uh, I, I only missed one meeting, and that was the uh, meeting in early March. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that, uh, that I missed that meeting, I was prepared to participate in that meeting remotely. Um, the only reason we missed it is because the airports were closing and we had to, to get the delegation home safely. Uh, we, had to, uh, we had to fly out before we had planned on flying out, and we had to fly nine hours in the wrong direction to Dubai in order to get home. Yeah. Uh, or else I wouldn't have even missed that meeting. But uh, 
I help set the agenda. I discussed the emergency declaration with the city manager. Uh, because of devices like this, you know, we're able to communicate pretty effectively over long distances and across time zones. So the idea that I sort of just disconnected and, and uh, didn't care about what was happening in Pasadena is a false narrative. Okay. And uh, one of the comments says it was a day after uh, you declared a public health emergency. You go or go you. <laughs> yeah, I, I just have to say that the, the person who's making that comment is well known to me. That she's a, She is a uh, an operative of my opponent's campaign. So while I, it's great that she can share this forum, her motive is very clear. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I have very little to say to her. Right. And uh, this is my show, Mayor. So bye-bye. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mayor, thank you for uh, joining us. This is uh, Leanne Moore, um, your host with Kitchen Talk today. This is an interactive show. We are live on Facebook and on YouTube. So if you have uh, comments, positive comments uh, or questions, please be sure to put them in the comment below. We will try to get them to the mayor. Um, mayor Tornick, I want to talk a little bit about the Anthony McClain uh, shoot, police shooting. Um, I, you know, it's been said in a lot of different outlets out there that you uh, ran the protesters off your front yard. Uh, you know, of course, they were, we were all up, uproared about what happened and they wanted answers. And anybody can go, you can Google, you can do all of that, and you can see the full length video. There's several. Uh, the mayor did go outside his home. He politely spoke to all of the people. Um, and one thing you did say, Mayor, is that uh, they wanted answers. And uh, I had the council member Kennedy, John Kennedy, on uh, some time ago, uh, passionately discussing the police oversight proposal that you two had uh, put together. And uh, you promised those people that the, that Monday, I, I believe that was a Sunday, I, forgive me if I don't have that right, but you promised them that Monday, you will get that proposal to the council. And you did. You got the unanimous votes for that. Congratulations. Well, that experience, you know, was, uh, look, the whole experience um, overlaid on this terrible you know, pandemic uh, that we're all going through. We, we have this, this whole social justice movement that was set in motion by the May 25th um, uh, shooting of uh, uh, and killing uh, in uh, Minneapolis, George Floyd. Um, and so I attended several of the demonstrations and um, that, that happened in front of City Hall uh, local demonstrations where people were crying out for justice and change um, and and to be heard right. and it really it activated me you can't you can't live through an experience like that without being moved and without recognizing that people um, have voices that that are full of frustration and fear and anger um, and so I I signed President Obama's foundation's pledge to listen to people and to study uh, opportunities for reform and to make proposals uh, for reform. Um, the Obama Foundation asked that we do it in 90 days. I, I committed to doing it in 60 days. Um, and so that's what set in motion uh, Council Member Kennedy's uh, effort uh, with me to, to try and uh, really build on the research that had been done years earlier in Pasadena about civilian oversight uh, and finally put it in place. So when the protesters uh, appeared at, at my house <laughs> uh, in force uh, in the dark, it, it's, <laughs> frankly, it's, it's, a little, um, it's, it's a little scary uh, because you don't know who's in the crowd. You can't, you can't see everybody. They're just voices in the dark and people well, are angry. You knew, you knew it was Jasmine because she had well, the Walmart. <laughs> yeah, there are some people I knew. I'm, I'm not so much worried about the people I know. I'm, I'm worried right. about the people I don't know. Right. And, and uh, you know, People can who aren't even from Pasadena can join on to these uh, demonstrations and and um, you know be disruptive. And I was alone. You know, I mean, I just came out and and uh, stood in front of my house and met them on the sidewalk. This business about running them off the lawn. What I was concerned about was mm -hmm. there were some people that were circling around behind me, um, and I I don't I didn't like that. I, I didn't like the idea that people were 
going to be behind me and, and I couldn't see what was happening behind me. My wife was alone in the house. Uh, so I, I uh, was not uh, going to accept that. And so I asked people to stay on the sidewalk. But then I listened politely and, and attentively to what people had to say. And I tried to answer their questions uh, with the truth. And the truth was that I couldn't give them everything that they were asking for. And I, so I didn't kid them. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, you know, my practice is not to make answers up just to please, to tell people what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. But I did tell them that we had it on the agenda for Monday and I would do everything in my power. I couldn't promise them a result. I didn't know what the result would be. That's right. But, but what I can do as mayor is make sure that it at least moves forward. Um, and happily we did, uh, John, John and, and my, uh, efforts were rewarded with the unanimous uh, vote of the city council. And we're still keeping up the pressure. I mean, last Monday, I put on the agenda um, the process to appoint the commissioners okay. to the, commission over, this is the police oversight commission. And I'm still getting pushback from members of the council. We're not ready. We need to do more study and we need more staff reports. I mean, I think that's all part of the same fundamental difference of approach. I mean, I think that this issue is so transcendent. It's so upsetting to members of the community. Yeah. That we can't conduct business as usual. We can't appoint study commissions and hire consultants and spend months or years trying to deliver a result. We need to make something happen now. And I will continue to maintain the pressure to make that happen. Um, and I, I certainly hope that I'm reelected so that I can, in fact, bring that to fruition. Um, I, I'm not confident about what the outcome will be uh, otherwise, but, but I, as long, all I can say is as long as it's within my power and I have the ability to influence the outcome, I will maintain the pressure to, to make sure this police oversight commission is appointed, that the, that the commissioners are trained, that they're put in place to do everything that we ask them to do and help us to hire the uh, independent uh, auditor um, that we've all, was also part of the package that John and I put together. So I'm I'm optimistic about the outcome, but this is a process. It's not a one-time deal. This is you have to be in it for the long haul to be successful when you're trying to accomplish significant change. Right. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have a question here from um, looks like Anthony McFarland. Uh, could you share your position about the recent protest on police brutality or the misuse of their power and authority? Um, are there any new requirements or measures being taken for police reform? Well, you know, it's it's so interesting. Yesterday we had a um, a meeting of the uh, Public Safety Committee. Uh, we meet every two weeks. John Kennedy is the chair of that committee. And the first half of that meeting, well, there was some fire department related stuff because that's part of public safety as well. But the first half of that meeting was devoted to proactive uh, community-based activities that the police, the police department does and has done for, for years and years. Um, there was you know, discussion about the community outreach, about the PAL program, about the cadet program, about efforts to um, involve uh, young people in, in being interested in careers in law enforcement. All that stuff that the police, did, and that's not new. I mean, that's, that, that's, those are activities that have been going on literally for generations in Pasadena and have served people very well. And then there was discussion about the youth diversion program that uh, has been put in place with, in Pasadena that's cooperative between the police department, the city attorney's office, and the uh, Flint Ridge Center which is an effort to, with juveniles uh, who may have been arrested or have gotten into trouble, to move them out of the criminal justice system uh, and into other forms of remediation so that they can avoid having a, a record uh, and they can avoid going to, to detention facilities and, and all the things that happen when you get into the criminal justice um, uh, rubric. And so, those activities, you know, it's like people don't know about them or recognize them or think that they're important. Police reform, uh, as I was saying earlier, is, is a process. It's not a one-shot thing. Uh, the civilian, you know, I mean, this chief, John Perez, has done some revolutionary things in terms of the way he's conducting hiring, training, recruitment, um, the ongoing training the police officers receive. He's reorganized the department from top to bottom. 
he's trying to create a truly community-based um, policing effort. Um, and I think that there's very little recognition of, of those kind of positive activities because they get swallowed up um, when we have an unfortunate incident, important but unfortunate incident, uh, in terms of particularly an officer-involved shooting uh, like Mr. McLean. And so I, I think it's important for people to step back a little bit and understand that the Pasadena Police Department has in place and has in some cases for years reforms that other police departments are only now just talking about uh, and thinking about. That's happened in Pasadena quite some time ago. The, the composition of the Pasadena Police Department is majority-minority. There are more minorities on the Pasadena police force than there are um, uh, white people. And I think that, you know, that sort of goes unnoticed and unrecognized when we, when everything falls apart and we get into a, a confrontational situation over a shooting. I'm not downplaying the significance of the shooting, uh, how, how consequential it is. I'm not forgetting about earlier shootings in terms of what's happened in Pasadena. But I'm just saying that people need to have a, a more, have a broader uh, sense of what the Pasadena Police Department is than some of them do. Uh, we know that we have work to do and, and some distance to travel uh, and that we'll never be perfect. But I think that the hallmark of effective government is when you identify issues and you work constructively to resolve them. And I think that's what's been happening with the uh, Pasadena Police Department. Okay, thanks, Mayor. Uh, what is the police department doing in terms of community involvement? Um, you know, I forget what you call it, but getting more involved with the community. Um, that was my first question. And the second one, do you know how many police, of police officers are from Pasadena or the surrounding areas? Yeah, uh, on the first point, I, I wish that I had a tape that I could throw up on your screen now. I'm okay. uh, just looking for the file. This was the um, this was the presentation we had yesterday at Public Safety uh, from the Pasadena Police Department on community relations, okay. uh, the ongoing programs that the police department. Uh, this is I'm going to make sure this is available online. I was going to say maybe they, you can put it on your your page. Yeah, I, I'll do that because they yeah. spent about an hour going through all the programs. I'm not going to try to okay. recapture them, uh, recapture them now. Uh, in terms of the, the community outreach, the police activities league, the community youth advisors, the neighborhood services unit, um, the community outreach unit. I mean, the, the police department is loaded with community outreach efforts. When questions like that get asked, yes. it demonstrates that obviously not everybody knows about it, That's and right. so we, we need to do more. But there is there is not a lack of effort or qualified people working on it. Uh, and that's what I was trying to talk about earlier, but I will. I think that's a great idea, Leanne. I'm, I'm going to post that presentation uh, on my webpage so that people who are interested can see it. Okay. Um, and in terms of the composition uh, of the department, the the um, one of the important uh, modifications that that uh, John that John Perez has put in in place uh, is to really try to hire locally. Okay. And what he's done is every time he, he goes through, uh, there's a hiring class, you know, a group of six or eight new officers, he brings them to the city council and introduces them. And I, I can tell you, I, my memory may not be accurate, but I think of the eight officers uh, mm -hmm. that he brought us in the last group of new hires, I think um, six or seven of them mm -hmm. uh, lived locally, not necessarily in Pasadena, but in the immediate uh, okay. area, Monrovia, Altadena, you know, the, the neighborhood, um, okay. and uh, or were born here. So I, okay. I, he's extremely conscious of how important it is to hire people um, who have a sense of, of what the community is about and aren't strangers uh, to the community that are commuting in from, you know, some other place. Uh, and okay. so that's top of mind, I know, for this police chief. It is. Yeah. OK. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to play um, a video that I think it would give the viewers a good look uh, about you as mayor, what you've done, and also talk a little bit about the police oversight proposal. And then we'll talk about it on the other side.
After the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, there was this national uprising. And then here in Pasadena, the murder of Anthony McLean by a police officer ignited more protests here in Pasadena, but it's been civil. It's been a matter of people negotiating and talking with each other. We pride ourselves for being a first class city, but when it comes to policing, there's been a question mark. The community was saying to me that there seemed to be various types of policing depending on the section you lived in, the city of Pasadena, because in policing it's supposed to be colorblind. We had to do something. We had to demonstrate to the community that we were listening, that we heard them. Mayor Tornick was there at our side at the negotiating table because we had developed a relationship of some trust and understanding between him and the activists in the community. So when things in other cities were getting out of control and getting inflamed, here the, the hot anger became cold anger. I don't think anyone could be immune to uh, reacting and saying, you know, this kind of thing has really got to stop. Uh, and so I felt that we couldn't ignore this issue and that we really needed to uh, to make something happen in Pasadena and demonstrate to the public in Pasadena, the general public, not just the minority population, that we were going to make some important progressive changes in the way we do business in Pasadena. Mayor Tornick was at his best when it came to talking to people in the community, talking to the police, talking to the business community, talking to the NAACP, for Endola, the immigrant rights group here in Pasadena, the American Civil Liberties Union, people who are experts in the field and saying, what is it we can do here in Pasadena as soon as possible to get some stuff done that will change the culture of the police department and change the rules by which they operate? The mayor and I have taken a lot of arrows for taking leadership and presenting something to our colleagues on the Pasadena City Council. But that's the risk that was worth taking because if you're going to have truly one Pasadena, you have to have all of Pasadena feeling that it's being treated fairly. A lot of my friends among the activist community in Pasadena thought, oh yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna give us lip service, you know, like all politicians apparently do, and they're gonna tell us they're going to do something, and then it's going to be delay, 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 and uh, we'll never say anything. I was determined to bring it to a vote, to have a definitive conclusion. I didn't know what the outcome would be exactly, although I suspected that it would be a positive outcome. But I felt that we owed it to the community, and when I told the, the protesters on my front lawn uh, a couple of days earlier was that I would be bringing it to the council for a vote on Monday. And I think some of them were surprised at how quickly this happened and surprised at how quickly Mayor Tornick grabbed the issue and ran with it and got the votes on the city council. In the end, it was never Terry Tornick and John Kennedy. It was the whole Pasadena City Council led by the titular head of the city, Mary Terry Tornick, moving the city council as a whole to get to a place of consensus that's real leadership. Not because I say I have leadership, it's because you demonstrate leadership and objectively the community can say to you, that's leadership. We think that democracy means a lot of meetings, but ultimately it means getting stuff done. So on the one hand, I was uh, impressed by the mayor's patience at talking to everybody he could, but once he decided that, okay, let's get something done, the best of him came out. Within 48 hours, the city council unanimously voted to do something that is unprecedented in Pasadena, which is to create a civilian oversight committee of, for the police department. It's not inconsistent to say that we believe in our police department, but we know we can do better. I think that is a, a sort of a fundamental premise of government in general, but particularly in this area. And it's absolutely clear to me that we have hard work to do in terms of gaining the confidence and the trust of the minority community in Pasadena, that they don't need to be fearful about being stopped by a police officer, that they can have confidence in the police department, and for the most part, I think they do. Uh, but we have some work to do, and we're gonna do it. 
So we're seeking unbiased, fair, and proactive policing. And I think we're moving in the right direction because of Terry Tornick's leadership as mayor of this city. Okay, Mayor, I love that video. I think it uh, explains everything about who you are as the mayor of the city uh, of Pasadena and how hard you and city council member uh, John Kennedy fought for the city to submit this proposal and to get it uh, approved by the council. Well, the, the point though, Leanne, is as you understand, is that, that that's the beginning, not the end. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way, the way that that this works mm -hmm. uh, is that you just don't have a, a little success, uh, get a vote and then sort of forget about it. The way that this is gonna make a difference over time is if we keep the pressure on, if we continue to take the steps along the way, get the process in place, appoint the commission, let them get, get to work uh, mm -hmm. providing their oversight. And if it works right, it's my belief that the, the, both the people and the police department will be well served. If the police department is operating in an in a, in a, a environment of trust, if people believe that the police department are fair yes. and that they are um, treating everybody fairly, uh, their job is going to be easier than if, they, if, the, uh, if, if they, people can't make the characterization that the police department is an army of occupation and is completely insensitive to the neighborhood's needs and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So the, the police are going to be safer and they're going to be able to do their job better, more effectively, if they're operating in a friendlier environment. There are always going to be bad people out there. We need police. And the, and the minority community knows that as well as anybody. Um, so it's not a matter of get, getting rid of police. It's a matter of making sure that police treat everybody fairly and protect everyone from those bad actors that uh, that need to be disarmed yes. and and removed from the street. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, again, I think that video really uh, shares a lot of what you've been doing as the mayor and how hard you are fighting for the city of Pasadena. Okay, Mayor, I, I have a couple of questions. One um, about COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm. um, it has been on a rise. Uh, uh, when will the city reopen? And uh, what criteria will you use to determine whether the city city should reopen? And then we can also, maybe you can incorporate about the businesses uh, in Pasadena. Some are shutting down. Um, you know, what is in place to vitalize the city back? Maybe some minority owned, small old business take these locations. Um, so if you can answer that quickly. <laughs> Well, the, you know, the, the, the magic question is when things will reopen. And the answer is that uh, everything won't reopen until there's, a, until there's a viable vaccine. That's the truth of it. Okay. Uh, every every uh, once a week, uh, and it was this morning, I have a, a phone conversation with um, Dr. Go, who's our, our public health official, um, and um, Dr. Ferrer, who's the LA County health official, a Mayor Garcia from Long Beach, and County Supervisor Barger. Okay. And we talk over these exact issues. And um, the answer is that it's gonna be a while before we're really open. I mean, really open with everything open. Uh, we keep trying to get more things reopened. They're just little tweaks. So that for example, there's a new definition of uh, personal health services. You know, we opened the barbers, we reopened the barber shops and the beauty parlors. They were supposed to be limited to 25%. That 20 capacity, that 25% limit is going to be eliminated. More personal services like uh, waxing and, and other uh, personal services are going to be allowed to reopen. So we're reopening a little bit at a time. But the fundamental uh, problem is that as things open, uh, infections go up. As there's more contact and people get more relaxed yes. about wearing masks and being careful, uh, the, the, the uh, infection rate goes up. And until we've got a vaccine, that's going to continue to be the tightrope that we're on, trying to, at the one hand, open businesses, and on the other hand, not get everybody sick and, and dying. 
Pasadena has lost, uh, as you said earlier, 129 people. Uh, some people email me and say, well, 129, that's not many. We got 140,000 people. What's 129? And that's that may be true unless it's your mother. Right. Uh, or your right. sister. And, um, and the truth is, the thing that sort of makes me a little crazy is that people say, well, the fact that we have so few deaths and, and a limited number of infections show that you're being too strict. Well, the real the reality is the reason we have so few deaths and infections is because we are holding the thing down, because we are being strict. If we just turned it loose, we can see from what's happening in Wisconsin today and what's happening in Europe and other places around the world, we know what the result is. There's no, there's no mystery to this. So we have to continue to suffer through this. The small businesses... Are, and the kids are suffering the worst. Yes. And I'm absolutely mindful about that. I talk with Dr. McDonald, Brian McDonald, the superintendent of, of schools uh, all the time about when we can get the schools open, how we can get the kids back in the class. They're pointing toward January 11th, as you probably know at the PUSD uh, to get things open. The small businesses are gonna suffer for a long time and many of them are not gonna survive. Um, that's particularly true for minority businesses, but it's true for all small businesses. And so we have had a small uh, small business assistance program. It's clear to me that the 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 residual, you know, the effects of this pandemic are going to carry on well beyond the termination. You know, when we do have a vaccine, and the city is going to have to be more active in doing things to assist small businesses. And we're working on on ideas of what we can do right now. Okay. I thank you, Mayor. I've enjoyed you on this show. It's an hour show, and I need another hour. <laughs> <laughs> so we, you know, we are, we have twelve days until November third, I believe, and um, we want everybody to go out and support reelect Mayor Terry Tornick as Pasadena's mayor. He's done a wonderful job, despite you know what other people say. You have him here. You see him. You, if you've seen him in the community. Um, you know, one of your supporters, uh, Mayor, said that you attended an event, I believe it was before COVID. You did not announce yourself. You did not uh, make any comments. But you were sitting in that building where the people were uh, voicing their needs and concerns. You were listening. You're a great listener. And I've seen that um, in uh, the Zoom meetings and all these different things that you have participated in, uh, listening to what Pasadenians have to say. Yeah, they, they, I appreciate that. I I, um, I go to a lot of meetings, um, and I now I'm doing it by Zoom, okay. uh, because I I do need to hear what what people have to say and 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 what they're thinking. Um, I've been attacked on the basis that I'm not a good listener and and that I'm I'm uh, harsh uh, and and don't agree with people. Um, I have to tell you that I. Uh, and my wife has been telling me that for years. Um, but she the, knows this. <laughs> I mean, she knows better than anybody. But but I I'm an active listener. I listen very carefully. The difference is that I, after I listen and after I study the issue, I tell people what I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think people deserve to hear the truth, even if even if I don't agree with them. I know that politicians are supposed to make everybody feel that that uh, you agree with everybody on everything. That's not the way I operate. It's not the way I grew up. Uh, I was told to tell the truth and share pe with people what you believe. So when people say I'm not listening to them, what some of them mean is that I'm not agreeing with them. And that's true. Uh, but you'll always know where I stand on an issue. And I don't arrive at a conclusion without listening and without studying. So I, I plead guilty to expressing my opinion and doing it forcefully. But I think people deserve to hear the truth and understand why you take a position. And that that's that's the only way I know how to operate. Wow, that's the best policy, Mayor. So uh, we have a few minutes left in the show. Um, I want you to, uh, you know, as they say, give us your closing remarks. But before we do that, uh, I don't know if this, I can, this will be a lift you up or a disappointment. We are not going to have our Rose Bowl, <laughs> our Tournament of Roses. Uh, if my uh, history works here in my mind, it was established in 1890. Uh, this will be the fourth time in history 
1945, World War II, we did not have a rose parade turning the roses. Um, also, I think uh, 37 million viewers plus viewers uh, in 2019, and we had about 7 million spectators that come to the Rose Bowl annually. I mean, how devastating is this going to be emotionally? We're all going to be devastated. But financially, how uh, is that going to affect the city? Well, the um, there won't be a parade. There may be a game. That, okay. that's, that's sort of still up in the air. Um, but there won't be a parade. That's true. The Tournament of Roses is putting together a TV broadcast, uh, which the networks are going to play, which is going to be, as I understand it, I've just I've got to go record something for it. But it's a sort of a highlights reel of, uh, oh, of that's nice. best, uh, best Rose Bowl rest, uh, uh, Tournament of Roses parades yeah. in history with with entertainment. I mean, so I think it'll be entertaining and it'll keep the idea of, of Pasadena and New Year's Day uh, alive, even though we won't have a parade. Okay. Financially, it is devastating. Yes. Um, the biggest hit to the city budget is having to cover the debt uh, of the Rose Bowl. We're going to have to pay out more than eight million dollars <laughs> this year in debt service because they can't have events, you know, and, right. and so they're not raising money. Uh, so it's a big problem, but we'll get through it. We have we have strong financial reserves. We're able to get through this, and God willing, uh, you know, next year the the Rose Parade will be bigger and better than ever. Yes. All right. All right, Mayor. Well, we'll look for that replay. Uh, I think that'll kind of give us some normalcy to see that on TV because it's supposed to happen. Okay, Mayor. Tell the people, um, you know, that are watching the show today, um, what you need from them. You need their vote, so I'm going to let you do that. Well, look briefly. I, I, you know, a lot of people have voted already, um, and I urge people to vote early. Uh, they can, they can vote. Uh, the postage is paid, and the and the postal service, contrary to what some of us may think, is reliable. Uh, but we've also got eight drop boxes around the city where you can put your ballot and be sure that it's going to be collected the same day and, and get to the right place. This means a lot to the city. Um, this election is important. It's been a privilege to be the mayor of Pasadena. My family has uh, grown up here. My kids uh, went to school here. I've got grandchildren who are now in the public school system and, and uh, have been at PCC. And so we're really vested in Pasadena. Pasadena has been great to our family, and this is my way of, of giving back. Uh, I have the kind of training and experience and attitude um, and determination to continue to serve the city well. I hope uh, that, that, that I'll have a chance to be able to do that. I've got some, some projects that I've started that I'd like to get more deeply rooted in the community so that my grandchildren will live to enjoy them here in Pasadena. Uh, I believe that everybody has to share in what a what a fabulous place Pasadena is, and not everybody is. Not everybody has the same experience in Pasadena, and so we need to continue to particularly focus on people, underprivileged people, who don't get to share and all the wonderful things that Pasadena has to offer. So I hope that people will vote. Uh, I hope they'll vote early, and of course I, mm -hmm. I urge them to vote for me. And parenthetically, I also urge people to vote yes on measures O and P. Measure O is an important uh, a school bond for the PUSD, and Measure P is a city uh, funding process that's been in place for 40 years that needs to be renewed. So in addition to voting for me, Terry Tornick, and I'm first on the ballot, also look for measures O and P and vote for those as well. They're important to Pasadena. All right. All right, Mayor Tornick. The Honorable Mayor Terry Tornick. The Thank you. Mayor Thank you, Mayor Thank you, Mayor, and so fun. much. And God bless you and your family. Uh, stay safe. Uh, if I were voting in Pasadena, I would be voting for you. So you all take my vote and put it down because I can't vote in Pasadena, but I am voting. All right. And we have 12 days, you all. Please, please, please go out and vote. Uh, they say like your life depends on it. Our lives do depend on the vote. So please go out and vote. Be sure to vote for Terry Tornick as the mayor of Pasadena so he can continue the legacy and uh, the improvement and be on board with all the changes that the world is going through 
and also be a part of that of the changes of the city of Pasadena. Mayor, you're welcome to come back on when you win. I I'll love to have you on. And thanks again for coming on Kitchen Talk. Thank you. All Stay right. safe. Yes, thank you. And to you too. All right, everybody. That was our mayor, Pasadena, Mr. Terry Tornick. Uh, he is up for re-election for the, the mayor of city of Pasadena, as I stated. Uh, please be sure to go and vote. Um, he did talk about some measures, OMP, that he would like you to vote for. So let's be mindful of that when we vote. Um, I didn't get a chance to play my sponsors, but I'll do that now. And uh, we are uh, glad to have Bill Home Care Incorporated as our sponsor. With our gentle touch, we will care for you with all our hearts. Bill Home Care Incorporated, a California home care provider assisting with activities of daily living. They are located in Pasadena, 626-541. 6851 Bell Home Care Incorporated. And of course, uh, we have, let's see if it comes up, Impressive Properties USA, uh, which I'm the broker. Uh, we handle residential and commercial real estate and also licensed in the state of Nevada. Uh, Las Vegas is now the home of the Las Vegas Raiders. Great opportunities if you're looking to buy a home in Las Vegas. So be sure to reach out to us if you have any real estate needs. Uh, also, um, we have we have a few more minutes that I can actually uh, think I can play. Might cut off, but uh, please look at the Proposition 14. I'm sorry, Proposition 19, um, which will be on your ballots. Um, Hopefully I can get that to play and um, that will give you an explanation on the ballot. If I don't come back on, you all have a wonderful day. Thank you for watching Kitchen Talk and I'll see you next week. There are two main parts to Prop 19, a tax increase and a sweetener. The tax hike is on some people who inherit property from their families, and the sweetener is a way to help seniors, the disabled, and victims of wildfires and disasters. This is the second question that goes back to that old deal from 1978. That's when California enacted Prop 13, a law to keep property taxes down. Even if your home value goes way up, your property tax is only allowed to go up 2% a year. The older you get, the sweeter this deal becomes, but it has a side effect. It keeps seniors from wanting to move, worried that they'll pay much higher taxes if they go buy a new house. To help people over 55, also disaster survivors and the disabled, the law currently allows them to take this lower tax base and move it to a new home. But you only get to use this special rule if the new home is worth less than the old one. You can only use it once in a lifetime and only within the same county or a select group of counties that allow transfers. Prop 19 would change all that. You could move your lower tax base to a pricier home and only pay the difference. You could move this way up to three times and you could move to a new home anywhere in the state without losing your lower tax base. That's the sweetener. Now the tax hike, which is all about inheritance. When you die, if you leave your property to your kids and grandkids, they get to keep your lower tax base. If you inherit the house, this is a sweetheart deal. You get to pay taxes based on the last generation's property value. Prop 19 would raise property taxes by ending that inherited tax break in many cases. It's aimed at wealthy families who own big properties. Prop 19 still allows this tax break if you inherit your parents' house and decide to live in it. It also exempts farms. But if your mom or dad left you a bunch of rental properties or a strip mall, your property taxes on those would go up under Prop 19. Over time, the analysts figure Prop 19 would increase property taxes by a few hundred million dollars per year. Most of those new taxes would be dedicated to fire protection, but some would also go to local governments. A yes vote allows more flexible moves and increases the tax on inherited properties. A no vote keeps the law the way it is.
All right, everybody. Thank you for watching Kitchen Talk. And I want to give another thanks to the mayor of Pasadena. Remember the vote, November 3rd. Your vote does matter.